company called um, called Foresight Works, um, and we make a technology product called Knowledge Concierge, which I'll touch on a little bit later on. But that's uh, the uh, 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 kind of the first page. So this is Oxford University. It's the best university in the world. Um, it's also the oldest university in the English-speaking world. Cambridge came in second. Well done to them. Uh, but we tend not to spend too much time thinking about Cambridge uh, in Oxford. Um, but Oxford, like uh, in many cases, is also leading faculty in mega project management. So, for example, Oxford is home uh, to one of the leading vaccines for COVID. Uh, equally, although it's a very uh, ancient university with a pedigree, uh, it's also incredibly groundbreaking and cutting edge in terms of the research it carries on. Um, and that's also true for the field of mega projects. Field of mega projects in academic world is a niche area. It's not taught in many elite universities. Um, and our unit was established about 12 years ago by British Telecom with a 20 million pound grant, um, which established both a research and teaching program. In terms of the teaching programs, uh, we've got the MSc major program management, um, and of which Jenny is one of our um, uh, alumni. Equally, there's quite a number of alumni from Indonesia now uh, in the MSc major program management. I should say that there are scholarships for women in particular for this course, um, and I've been the director of this course for five years before uh, moving on to my startup. Uh, so if anybody's interested, please do get in touch. Uh, we're very keen to work with professionals uh, who are involved in building infrastructure. Um, equally, we run the Major Projects Leadership Academy for the UK government. All senior civil servants in the UK government must come to Oxford for this course, uh, which is taught by this faculty. Um, and that model has now been adopted by the governments of Australia, um, as well as Hong Kong. Um, and all senior civil, civil servants in these countries uh, benefit from the research and teaching in this area, which I will share in summary with you. So you're sort of getting a, an espresso version uh, of these, uh, this learning. Uh, not to bore you about too much about myself, I grew up in Pakistan. So emerging markets like Indonesia are, are very close to my heart. Uh, and building infrastructure and getting these mega projects right in these countries is essential to our social welfare. So uh, it's a topic of great importance to countries like Indonesia, Pakistan, um, Malaysia, India, etc. Um, apart from my academic roles at Oxford, Chinkwa at Stanford, um, I, as I mentioned, I'm a co-founder of a tech company building uh, an operating system for mega projects. I started my career at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., um, and I've done quite a bit of board level work with China Light and Power in Hong Kong with MTR, uh, but of course, Pertamina, Pititima um, uh, in Indonesia, uh, of, of which I'm, I'm thrilled. So let's get into the meat of it. Why do mega projects fail? Is the, is the question that I want to address today um, and give you some clues about how we might avoid such failures. So first of all, what are mega projects? This is Senator Norris looking at the Norris Dam uh, in 1930s. Um, and this was a series of dams built by um, uh, President Roosevelt when he became president. Um, and mega projects are $1 billion plus investments that have the potential to transform countries and companies. So if you look at pictures of uh, Dubai, for example, from 20 years ago to now, even 20 years ago, it looked like a desert, and now it's transformed into uh, a, a metropolis. Similarly, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, in 1960s and 70s, they looked empty. Um, and now these are uh, great, prosperous places, all driven by a sequence of mega projects done right. And you would see that evidence in your own home country as well. Now, the big idea is that the fourth industrial revolution is here. The world's gone from manual to mechanical, from mechanical to electrical, and now in the fourth industrial revolution, we've gone from electrical to digital. That digital explosion rests on data, and it involves what we call a 3S framework, so sensing a huge amount of data, for example, using sensors or Internet of Things devices or drones or satellites. Second is seizing upon that data using typically artificial intelligence and machine learning. And then finally, doing more with that data, scaling, typically using robotics. An example of that is Amazon.com. Amazon.com's revenues have gone up 10 times in the last 10 years, um, whereas the rival like uh, Walmart have not even doubled their revenues in the same amount of time. Now, it takes a Fortune 500 company like Walmart about one week to close their monthly books. 
it takes a, a government department in the UK the whole month to close their monthly books. So there's a month, one month lag. Many major projects are unable to close their books. So the XRL project in Hong Kong completed uh, in 2016, I believe, has yet to close its book, books because of outstanding claims and litigation that's ongoing. Um, Amazon is able to close its books in one hour. In fact, the monthly close is simply that hour's close. And the, the way Amazon powers that is by using a huge amount of artificial intelligence and robotics. That level of sophistication in the data is what enables Amazon, the way it looks at its inventory, the way it looks at what its customers are buying to be able to scale up that revenue. So even though we may think of uh, bookkeeping as a back office function, ability to be that advanced, even in these basic functions, is what's powering performance in the fourth industrial revolution. Now, mega projects are just not there. They are still living in a world of manual construction. It's still built like beehives uh, in a very handcrafted way. And we see evidence of that, both at the industry level, as well as the project level. So at the industry level, construction is the only sector in the economy all over the world where labor productivity has gone down. So a like for like wind farm built today, then the earliest wind farms built in 1990s, takes 20% more labor, which is unbelievable because banking takes far less people uh, to execute banking transaction. Um, there's been a 90% drop in labor hours required to do global shipping since the 1950s. Computing cycles are billions of times faster than they were in the 1950s, but construction is 20% slower. And that's an outstanding statistic even agriculture is performing better than construction. It's the only sector of the economy where productivity has gone down. And we pick up this data at the project level in the world's largest data set on mega projects, which is housed at Oxford University. So that's over 6,000 observations of mega projects. And we've looked at final investment decision, cost and time estimates, and the actual outs and values. And as you can imagine, Cost overruns and time overruns are a particular problem in the industry. So depending on the asset type we look at, like roads or energy or dams, cost overruns of you know, 30% uh, or 50% or 100% are not uncommon. Now, the Olympics have the dubious honor of having the highest cost overrun. And up until Tokyo Olympics, Olympics had never been delayed. But this is the first time in history that Olympics have also been delayed. Um, so it's no longer, um, uh, you know, it's also prone to schedule overruns. Um, and a bigger, even bigger problem than cost overruns and time overruns are benefit shortfalls. So that's when you don't get the benefit that you built the project for. So if you, if you think about it, you then end up with this really compromised position where you spend billions of dollars, things don't get delivered on time. So give you an example. In Pakistan, where I grew up, there's uh, a flooding is a, a recurring problem. Almost every other year we have major floods. If you build a dam to control that flooding, the total construction cycle of a dam from planning as well as its construction itself is over 16 to 20 years long. That's almost an entire generation of floods before you're going to get that benefit of flood prevention. So these solutions are just no longer valid. They don't work. We need far more agile ways of actually providing those benefits to the farmers that are suffering those floods today, not in 20 years time. Oops. So when these mega projects go wrong, they go horribly wrong. So in the case of the tragic accident in Maconda, um, it caused fatalities, but it also impaired the share price of BP, which is in the, in the light purple line on my chart there. BP just never recovered from this. And this leads to what we call sad mega projects. So this is the payoff structure. If you think about the cash flow profile of a poorly designed mega project, the, there's a firm ceiling to the benefits you can get. So Maconda could have only produced a fixed or finite number of barrels of oil. It couldn't produce more than what was in the ground. However, the, the liabilities are nearly infinite. So the amount of payouts, the litigation, uh, the government fines, there's almost no no floor to that. So although your benefits are capped in poorly designed mega projects, 
there's absolutely no, no floor to the amount of liabilities you can accrue for environmental damage, for social unrest, uh, for work compensation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So our job is to try and prevent this, to make this, uh, to move towards happy mega projects. And also it's a timeless problem. So this is data on the Y axis are cost overruns, on the X axis are the year in which a dam was approved. As you can see, cost overruns have not disappeared. The red line is the, is the on budget line. Almost all the dams built since the 1930s have had cost overruns, some of them spectacular like in Visegrad in, uh, in Yugoslavia in the 19, uh, 1980s, 1990s. And the blue line is the line of best fit. So on average, dams have cost double of what was estimated, and that slope has not gone down. So we're not learning from our mistakes in mega projects yet, uh, which is something now, as we move to new forms of infrastructure, we have an opportunity to, to incorporate that learning. And by the way, it's a timeless problem. What I'm showing here is even Romans, when they were building aqueducts, suffered similar issues. Um, so we like these timeless issues uh, in Oxford uh, that require new ways of, uh, of breaking that mold. So why do these mega projects fail? I'm going to give you three causes, and we'll have a very short discussion about how do we overcome them. The first of them is, as you see over here, is a little kitten looking at itself into the mirror and what it sees is a lion with a fully grown mane. That psychologists call optimism bias. So all human beings need optimism bias. We need, need it to get out of bed, but that optimism also leads to overconfidence. So our brain is unable to process the amount of risk that these mega projects take. And as a result, we end up starting down the route of projects that, are, that shouldn't be started or need to be you know, redesigned from scratch. Now, this is a, a famous example of a cognitive bias. This is a famous optical illusion that you might have seen. And as you probably all know from your childhood encounters with this optical illusion, the idea is that although the lower line looks bigger, both these lines are equal. Now, there's two problems with this. First of all, even the experts who design this optical illusion cannot unsee this. So they still, they know, they designed this optical illusion, they still see the lower line to be longer than the above line. So even when you know, knowledge of biases does not correct biases. Even being an expert in biases, even designing biases does not correct biases. So there's, a, there's limitations to the human brain that the brain cannot overcome. And that gets worse in complexity. A second point here is that I could be deliberately tricking you. I could have deliberately made the lower line longer and you wouldn't know unless you measured it. So the only way to overcome it is by using a foot ruler and checking for yourself how long are these lines. So in a way, without measurement, you can't really solve it in your head alone. Second is... We see this over and over again. So giving you, giving you an example, in the Chivo Dam in Colombia, there's excellent optimism. So the, the business case or the uh, project appraisal document of the World Bank says, no allowance has been made for possible fluctuations of the exchange rate. And it says, this is justifiable because the government of Colombia is behaving in an enlightened manner. The reality is that the peso depreciated 99% against the US dollar in that intervening period when the dam was being built. And that caused a 35% increase in real terms. So half the dam was imported uh, in hard currency. And as the peso depreciated, that cost spiral out of control. Um, and you know, one shudders to think what would have been the case if, if the government had not been enlightened. Now, a second reason for why mega projects fail is, is because of this gentleman here. This is uh, Niccolo Machiavelli. He wrote a, a famous book called The Prince uh, in Medieval Italy. Um, and he gives us a formula um, and he writes um, that princes and princesses of these city-states in Italy, back in, in Medieval Italy, he says, if you want to get raise taxes on your citizens and you want to build something, make sure that you overstate the benefits and you understate the costs 
And that's the only way anybody will let you build something. So you lie about how much benefit you'll get and you exaggerate it and you lie about how much it's going to cost and you downplay it. And, and that's how you get a project funded. That Machiavellian formula has not changed. Now, strategic misrepresentation is a polite way at Oxford to call, you know, it's Latin for lying. Uh, but basically, that's what happens at the start of mega projects. We downplay the costs, we overestimate the benefits, and at the end of the project, the equation reverses. Now, example of this, and this leads to court cases, actually. An example of this is the Brisbane's Clem 7 tunnel. So in that, AECOM had exaggerated the number of traffic, the amount of vehicles that would use the road. And that uh, exaggerated number got put into the business cases, the money was approved, the road got built, and then people just did not show up. The sponsors sued and won the court case, and AECOM had to pay over 280 million Australian dollars. Uh, to settle that lawsuit. But it's to sort of give you an evidence that this, this process of strategic misrepresentation is not just uh, fiction, it's just happening, and people have to work very hard uh, through the legal process to overcome it. So that's the second reason for why mega projects are prone to failure. One is our natural optimism, where the brain cannot do the job. The second is strategic misrepresentation, when the brain goes into overdrive and does a bit too much of the job, does too much cooking. A third is complexity. And this, this example is the first one, optimism bias comes from psychology. Um, uh, strategic misrepresentation comes from political science and complexity comes from physics uh, as the underlying causes. This is the schedule of a major project like a nuclear power plant. Each dot is a specific task that needs to get done in order for that plant to get built. And as you can see, this project is immensely complicated. A huge number of tasks need to get done, and they have very complex relationships. So for example, in a simple house, in order to build the walls, you first have to build foundations. That relationship between the foundations and walls is known as a finish to start relationship. But in a nuclear power plant, you have many, many things to do, and they each have very complex interdependencies with each other. When you map those interdependencies, this is the mess you see. Now, the problem with this kind of mess is that human beings cannot process it. We just do not have the cognitive apparatus to be able to overcome this level of complexity. And to give you an example, complexity is nonlinear. So as task size increase in a proportional linear fashion, the complexity increases in a nonlinear fashion. So P.W. Anderson, who won a Nobel Prize in physics, he says that quantity has a quality of its own. So an example of that is a 100-word email is much easier to write than a 1,000-word essay, which is way easier to write than a 10,000-word master's dissertation. And a 100,000-word PhD dissertation is very, very difficult. A 100,000-word PhD dissertation is not the same as writing 1,000 emails. You could probably write 1,000 emails in a week. Almost no one, even very clever people in Oxford, can do their PhD in one week. So that's the difference between you know, tasks grow in a linear scale, but complexity grows in a power law scale. An example of that is EDF's Flamanville nuclear power plant that's been under construction for God knows how long, and it's unclear when it will ever finish. An example of that is that when they, they, ha they have to build the nuclear reactor, uh, and that requires a huge amount of precision uh, in terms of how the, uh, how the alloys are, 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 are established, and then they built a dome around it using a huge amount of reinforced concrete. Now, when they fired up the station as for a test run, they realized that because of impurities in the core, they had to, to redo it, which was a massively unfortunate event. So they said, OK, we're going to cut through the concrete dome in order to get to this core and replace it. But when they started cutting through the concrete dome, they realized that there was so much reinforced concrete, there's so much reinforced steel in this concrete dome that they just couldn't do it. There was just no way of cutting through it. So they had to blow up the whole thing. So they spent 4 billion euros building this dome uh, and the reactor core, 
and they have to start from scratch. So even very, very minor problems become huge issues in these overly complex mega projects. So to kind of conclude, how do we overcome optimism bias, strategic misrepresentation, and complexity? As an economist, what I can tell you is that underlying problem for all of this is information. It's poor information flows. So one thing you have to do is overcome that information flows by improving both the amount of information you have, but what's known as volume of information, the variety of information, so what kind of information you're using, and finally, the velocity of information. So the speed at which you are consuming that data. Um, and I'll just conclude very briefly. That's what I'm working on as the next phase, as the next chapter in my life, is to using fourth industrial revolution technologies, how do we plug into a huge amount of data on mega projects? How do we digest that data at great speed using machine intelligence? And how do we then assist human managers as, as a partner, as an assistant to them so that they can overcome optimism bias, strategic misrepresentation and complexity of mega projects? I look forward to your Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Atif Ansar. That is a very interesting topic. I'm sure they will lead the audience to ask some questions later. Thank you and very for much. those who would like to ask any questions, please write down your questions in the Q&A box. We'll discuss those questions in a short while after all the speakers deliver their presentation. And after having Dr. Atif Ansar from the University of Oxford for the Global Academic Perspective, now we'd like to invite our Indonesian speaker, Dr. Dharmawan Prasojo, the Deputy President Director of PLN Pesero, to share his ideas, experiences, and wisdom from the Indonesian business point of view. To Dr. Prasojo, the time is yours. Pak Kuntoro, Pak Profesor Dr. Kuntoro Mangkusubroto yang saya hormati Pak. It's an honor to be here Pak, invited by Rumi, Dr. Atif Ansar, Pak Dr. Teddy Chandra, moderator Ibu Jenny. It's an honor to be here. My presentation is how to manage mega projects from PLN's perspective. The subtitle is how we are able to bridge the past, the present, and the future. Dr. Atif already mentions complexity as a big challenge. In the power sector, sector, we are experiencing exactly what Dr. Latif just explained over there. There are so many variables, it's so complex. Dr. Ratif said interdependence, interconnected, multiple key decisions factors. Sometimes we fail to understand the causal effect relationship. That's why there is ambiguity. And there is also volatility. We understand there is a change, but it's very hard to understand exactly how the change over time is going to affect our decisions, how we manage our projects. Even there is lack of information uncertainty. In that regard, <clears throat> it's very hard to predict the future while we have to make a decision today. Sometimes I call it shooting in the dark. We have to pull the trigger, but it's in the dark. So that's why we need to shift FUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity to FUCA. Visions, we have to have understanding, we have to have a clarity, then we might be able to respond to the dynamics of the situations with agility. <clears throat> Pak Kuntoro might be very, this is your area, Pak. A long time ago, but there is what we call elasticity of demand. A long time ago, for each 1% of economy growth, there was 2% of electricity demand growth. A long time ago. 
from 2009 until 2014, the elasticity reduced to become only 1.34. At that time in 2015, using this elasticity, we predicted the demand growth of the electricity. At that time, we predicted the economic growth is roughly 6% and the electricity demand growth was roughly 8.6% per, per, per year. <clears throat> Suddenly there is a shift, tectonic shift. The economic growth is not utilizing energy intensive strategy anymore. Lighting used to be heavily using a lot of energy, but there is a new development of technology LED is becoming very efficient. The economic growth is coming from services, tourism, and some kind of consulting, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And most of the electricity demand is only coming from lighting and cooling, which unfortunately becoming very efficient. Then the elasticity shifted from 1.34 to 0.6. And today, under the COVID, even we're trying to still to come up with the computation correlation between the economic growth and then the electricity demand growth. What is the implications of this shift to the power system that we have today? We are experiencing what we call oversupply. The planning that we took, that we made decision five or six years ago, doesn't hold anymore. Under the oversupply, of course, our asset is becoming underutilized. We have a long-term contract with the third party, what we call the independent power producer. Under the contract, namely power purchase agreement, there is what we call take or pay. We utilizing the power plants, we pay. We didn't use the power plants, we still pay. Of course, it's becoming a challenge by itself. Are we fixing this problem? Yes. We map out every single challenge that we are facing today. We're trying to rectify every single thing. We are also at the transitions. The size of our sector today is roughly 300 terawatt hour. Demand growth is roughly 4.6% per year, meaning moving forward by 2060, the size of our system is roughly 1,800 terawatt hour. What is, why are we here? Pak Kuntoro already mentions we need to reach carbon neutral. We are here to ensure that the next generation is having better future than our current generations. How are we going to do it? We have to reduce CO2 emissions. We have efficient to have carbon neutral by 2060. Meaning we have to transition from coal fire power plants, from gas fire power plants to renewable energy. We already come up with the game plan. We start by 2025, we have, we start building what we call power plants with renewable energy as a base load. Our RUPTL, National Electricity Planning, is going to be released in the next couple of weeks. It's going, it's going to be the first green RUPTL in our Indonesian history. We start retiring the first stage of coal fire power plants, the subcritical by 2030, second stage 2035, and then supercritical power plants by 2040, and then 2045 until 2056. We start retiring also the ultra supercritical or implementing carbon capture and storage technology. Are we facing a challenge with this? Of course we do. But, but we believe humankind innovates. The price of renewable energy is going down day by day, week by week, month, month by month, year by year. I still remember 1995, I was 
installing 36,000 units of solar home system all over Indonesia. It was roughly 30 cents per kilowatt hour. Today, generation of solar panel is roughly only 4 cents per kilowatt hour. Could go down. The question is this, can renewable energy as a base load, because even we're talking about solar panel, is intermittent, is variable renewable energy. While if we want to shift from coal, from gas to renewable energy, we have to come up with the renewable energy as a base load that able to operate in the span of 24 hours continuously. So that's why the storage or the battery energy storage system is very important. Today, the battery energy storage system still roughly 13 cents per kilowatt hour. Can we have a dream here that generation costs of solar panel going to go down to only 2.5 cents until 3 cents? Can we have a dream that the battery energy storage system that today still roughly 13 cents can go down to only 3 cents? meaning that the total cost of renewable energy as a base load going to be able to compete, comparatively speaking, with the fossil fuel coal fire power plants. We believe we can. Humankind always innovate. In this climate change, we fight. We fight for our right to survive for our humankind to prevail. And then in this case, we have to manage. But Pak Kuntoro, the price of battery decreased by 26% every single year, Bapak. <laughs> so we are confident, Pak. So one day in the, in the near future, Renewable energy is going to come to the system not because not because of fit in tariff, not because it's utilizing the state budget, but because it's superior in terms of technical and in terms of commercial. Then it's going to come into the system because it's the best form of energy. We're shifting from fossil fuel to renewable energy. We're shifting from import energy to become domestic based energy, and is going to be environmentally sustainable. This is a balancing act. Yes, in the past, we are searching for affordable energy. If you look at China, 2002, the energy mix coming from coal was roughly 50%. By 2009, the energy mix from coal was roughly 86%. During that period, China emphasizing on growth, affordability, not environmental sustainability. Can we come up with the right balance? Of course we can. Indonesia rich of renewable energy with this kind of innovations is going to be environmentally friendly, sustainable, is going to be affordable, is going to be reliable. We need to work on it. In facing this challenge, of course, PLN is doing transforming. In the past, the fluctuation is only coming from the demand. In the future, fluctuation is also coming from the supply side when there is so much renewable energy going to come into the system. Then we modernize our systems. We digitizing our power plants. We digitizing our transmissions. It's number three here. We digitizing our distributions. We digitizing our smart meter. It's advanced meter infrastructure number twenty two. We digitizing, you know, in power plants there are five thousand sensors. Unfortunately, we didn't manage the information to become strategic information. So we're doing it. We're digitizing our procurement. With our supply, we come up with customer relationship management based on the digital platform. 
we're trying to make sure that our cost is very well managed. So that's why we are in the middle of transformations. We have 24 breakthrough. And from that 24 agendas, 17 involve digitizing our platform. For instance, in the past, our customer service is somehow in disarray. We have old PLN mobile, but the rating is only 2.5. Our customer data is not very well managed. The process of audits complaint is so long, so complex, is so slow. The feature is not there. And why that project failed? The reason is this. 18 months ago, I was appointed as a chief transformation officer by the Pak Zul, the CEO of PLN. So I look into it. It was only a partial approach, only from the software development approach. So they built the software. While in reality, when we're talking serving our customers, we're talking about the commerce, is under the director of marketing that setting the standard how we serve our customers. But it involves also operation on the ground under the director of business regional, and there is general manager, and there is manager of area branch office, and then also there's an outsource. And there is, of course, software development itself on the product development on the right side. And of course, there's a communication, there's product partnership. When we map this thing out, we realize it's, it involves a lot of stakeholders. Each of the stakeholders has to be able to deliver a milestone. And we have to stitch, to integrate, to consolidate the whole things becoming a real product. So that's why we built the new PLN mobile. Alhamdulillah, alamin. right now the rating is becoming 4.7. It's a shift of paradigm. Before, it was a very complex business process. How, what did we do? We streamlined the business process. It's becoming very simple. Before, it was so many platforms fragmented. Today, we're trying to unify the whole thing into one platform. And right now, the new PLN Mobile is the number three ranks is after Google Meet and Zoom is the number three in the business. And before it was only 400,000 download and then 350,000 unloading or uninstall. Today is roughly 8.7 downloads and it's going fast. And we're going to have 30 millions in which we're trying to show, serve our customer better with this new digital platform. And then how to ensure that all of this breakthrough in the transformations is going to work as planned. It's very simple. We map out every single stakeholders that involve to get the mission, each mission in the breakthrough accomplished. As a chief transformation officer, I'm going to have a contract of each of the stakeholders, executive vice president, vice president, branch office. And then I put it into the KPI in which I'm going to monitor weekly. If they didn't deliver, hell broke loose. They have to deliver. And that I state also with the key performance indicator of each individual that involved in the transformations. So there is only one way, which is moving forward. There is no other way. And then week by week, we state, we integrate to ensure that the deliveries of these 20 breakthroughs is being monitored, is being supervised week by week, month by month. 
its progress counts. We give, of course, appreciations, but of course, we also giving reprimands. Each week, there is transformation weekly story that led by the CEO, and then in which each of the breakthrough is being presented, attended by the whole PLN, you know, uh, leadership team. In that regard, we have agenda lean, we have agenda green, we, we have agenda innovate, innovative, customer focus. And until today, this agenda working very well. Mission has not been accomplished yet because we still have another 18 months to go with this transformation. Today, PLN core business is power and utility. We selling electricity, but we are in the transitioning to reach low carbon power systems. In the future, our main job is to take care of the environment. What is electricity is our byproduct. But in the process, we are building technology, we are innovating, we digitizing our current systems. So PLN is going to become a technology company. And what is power and utility? Yes, it's our byproduct. Part. <laughs> so we are in at the transitioning. And from today until 2060, there will be additional 1,500 terawatt hour additional production of electricity annually. That means 250 gigawatt additional capacity has to be built. That's going to involve roughly 700 billion US dollars additional investment. And with that, PLN cannot do this alone. We have to marshal technology, investment, policy, technical know-how in that regard. We are here to announce that this is a platform, how we're going to be able to collaborate domestic and international. So thank you so much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Pak. Thank you, Pak, Dr. Prasojo, for sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. And thank you again, Dr. Ansar, for sharing your knowledge. I'm sure we all can learn and gain positive insight from all presentation. Following the presentation, now we'd like to give the opportunity to the audience to ask questions to our respected speakers. I would like to pick some questions that are already in the Q&A box and highlight them for discussion with our speakers. We have approximately 30 minutes to discuss several questions. And because of the limited time, for those that could not get the chance to be discussed during this session, we'll share the question with the speakers to get the answers and send to all of you who attended today after this session. So um, our first question is to uh, uh, Dr. Atif Ansar. This is a question from Redno Wulan. Um, she asks, we publish an article related to complexity, leadership, and Indonesian transportation mega project performance. This study found that complexity is in mega project consisting of structural, social, cultural, and emergent aspects. Those aspects are interrelated and contingent based on context. Therefore, the project manager leadership competency must be simultaneously combined between technical, emotional, social, and adaptive to overcome many of complexity in the mega project. In other words, actually there is no best leadership formulation in mega project. Could you give your perspective about this, Dr. Atif? Absolutely, with pleasure. So really interesting research. You know, there's a, there was a famous uh, Oxford professor, an essayist called Isaiah Berlin, um, and he eventually became the master of Wolfson College. And he wrote an essay called The Hedgehog and the Fox. Um, and the idea is that the hedgehog knows one big thing, so it can just poof up, uh, whereas the fox knows many things. A fox is very clever, it's very handsome, it's able to be very agile. Um, 
so you know what you found in your research is spot on a mega project leader has to be a fox they need to know many things they can't just know one big thing so you're right there's no best form of mega project leadership but there is a bad form of mega project leadership and that bad form of mega project leadership is to be a hedgehog and that hedgehog is usually an overly technical person somebody who invariably and apologies of many engineers in the room but uh, trained as an engineer or an economist and never unlearned it like basically remained an engineer or an economist so the key is that as you build a mega project you need multiple skill sets um, and as you get more higher and higher up in your organization you have to learn to give up your expertise be it in the law or uh, a technical subject uh, or number crunching whatever you did uh, in order to get to the top uh, once you arrive at the top you have to start doing other things and much of it revolves around bringing people together stakeholder management um, so you know other arts uh, like anthropology and political science become a lot more important and I think it effectively what you're picking up evidence of and without having read your paper you know corresponds to that idea of how to be a fox in mega projects thank you thank you Dr. Atif yes uh, yes the next question goes to uh, uh, Professor Darmawan uh, you said that we have to have clarity, vision, and others in order to handle mega project, and maybe that applied to other types of project. I think if we do all that, but what makes the results so much different from what we expect? Um, the question is, how can we make sure we do all those four items right way, in the right way? Thank you for the questions. <laughs> you know, I think pa, Dr. Atif is, is an expert on this. <laughs> Actually, uh, how we are able to map out race. You know, even when we walk down the street, we are bearing some kind of race. How about if typhoon is coming and then we are being swept away, right? <laughs> We riding a bicycle, we also bearing some kind of race. How about, how, how about if a truck is coming by and cutting our lane and we got an accident? That's exactly what FUCA is about. Many decisions that we are making today in the future might be we going to regret. So how are we going to be able to map out? We have to think from comprehensive approach. For instance, in the PLN case, today we are experiencing oversupply. And our contract stipulating that demand risk is borne by PLN. And why that thing happened? Because PLN never experienced any oversupply in the span of 75 years of its existence. So at that time, the only mindset, the only paradigms that we need to add more capacities, never coming into the imaginations that even if we do projects, we need to balance between the supply and demand. So that's why like, we need to map out. We need to understand how we're going to be able to strike a balance. When we writing a fiscal policy, a contract between one party to the, to the next one, to the other, what is the spirit? The spirit is fairness, being fair. What is being fair is means? That means if the investment, let's say the rate of return is only seven or eight percent, of course, nobody wants to invest. It will be better for them to put their money under the mattress instead of investing. But of course, if the rate of return is roughly 20 percent or 25 percent, it's a little bit too high. Let's say 12 percent is a good one. So we need to come up with the right balance of a contract. 
is going to govern three things. If there is investment, we need to ensure the investment can be recouped. If there is any risk, we need to calibrate to manage the risk, so it's going to be very well balanced. If we offshore all the risk to the other party, we call, we're going to call it insurance company. But we need to come up with a well balance. Of course, if there is any profit, then we need to come up with a fair agreement between those. So with that in mind, we are facing a lot of challenges that we are facing today. We come up with much better contract. Also, today PLN is trying to increase the demand. We also trying to renegotiate with the third party. And then uh, there is a good, good news, of course, during this renegotiation, we somehow saving roughly 25 trillion rupees because we come up with a better contract than before. But again, I think Dr. Atif also might be able to answer this because <laughs> come up with a clear foundation of thinking, mapping out all the risks all the way to the future is not easy. Not at all. It's not I, easy. I have one. No, this is a very, very good, a very good con conversation, very good question. And uh, one, you answered that with great, uh, great wisdom. So I think that there's one way to look at the value drivers, as, as Pa mentioned, um, and understanding your demand drivers, your cost drivers, uh, and really mapping them out. An addition I'd like to build on that, uh, and it addresses one of the other questions somebody asked is about data, is often we think about risk as a visualization of the future. So we create a movie reel about what risks may happen, and we visualize the obstacles may come in the way. This psychologist, like Professor Daniel Kahneman, um, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, in fact, in 2002, he calls that the inside view. Uh, and that inside view is very helpful. There's quite a bit of expert judgment that goes into creating that forecast uh, of the future. However, like any individual view or inside view, that becomes easily biased. Um, so we may forget elements of this film reel. We may forget that some bits of the film reel are longer than others, for instance. So the only way to debias that is by looking at past comparable data. And that psychologists call a process this called reference class forecasting, uh, on which we've done quite a bit of work in Oxford. So the idea is that if you're doing a house renovation, you could simply do a, a kind of a, a plan of your renovation just with your builder. That would be, you know, you have to just accept the numbers that the builder has given you uh, and prone to quite a bit of bias. Uh, a second method is you could ask your neighbor of how much did they spend on their house renovation. That is already improving the estimate of the builder because you're getting a little bit more ver verification. However, your neighbor's experience as a single analogy is quite biased. So what reference and forecaster says is like, look, go out and ask 20 people and or 100 people. And if you can collect data, a big data set on all renovation projects and use that whole data to then inform your decisions. And I think that's where many mega projects could improve their performance. Often, each project is used as a unique opportunity, whereas in reality, it's simply a member of a much broader population of mega projects. And people will benefit from collecting data from past projects on cost, on time, on safety, on quality, and, and systematically analyzing that past data to, to predicting the future. It's not foolproof, but it improves our, um, uh, our foresight in, in, into, into an uncertain future. Yes, I may, I may add, you know, risk is something that we can measure. We know exactly what is risk. Uncertainty is we cannot measure it. <laughs> so to face the uncertainty, uncertainty, we just use a hunch, mm -hmm. conviction. I'm going to do this to, to overcome that. But race, we have to be able to measure it. Yes. And of course, you know, Dr. Active already mentioned, it's like a probabilistic modeling is using the historical data is one way. And in this case, in the PLN case, we use the elasticity of demand that is when we use that data, 
to predict the future demand, that number itself is shifting by itself because of technological development, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the prediction becoming off, and that's that's the things that we have to adapt to the situations. So yes. for only for the last couple months, what I did. I deploy my general manager in those area. So I measure the demand of electricity sector by sector and subsector. And I ask them directly, why your manufacturing capacity is only 40%? Opa, because of this, the market in the international market is, 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 is kind of down. And then we measure it, Dr. Atif, one by one, Dr. <laughs> and then we come up somehow, oh, the demand is today like this. And we ask them, like, what is your prediction 12 months from today, uh, two years from today, something like that? Because right now, we, we used to be able to use the elasticity, elasticity of demand. Right now, we don't have it. We don't have the yeah. numbers. Yeah. And they're still shifting. So that's why it's becoming very difficult. But anyhow, we have to pull the trigger. We need to come up with the long-term planning. So we need to come up with the number. So we do whatever it is just to ensure we're not shooting in the dark. We somehow can see the light. We can see the future. Something like that. Thank you. Um, no, thank you. This is very wise. Um, and uh, I think your key point that you can measure risk or quantify risk, but you can't quantify uncertainty uh, is spot on. Um, and in a private conversation, we could talk a little bit more about scenario planning um, because sometimes if long-term future and electricity demand in a fast-growing country like Indonesia is a very good example of uncertainty um, because you just don't know how much demand may, may arise, particularly as people switch out of fuel. So a fascinating conversation. You have to then paint the future and it's about looking at various scenarios uh, of what future you might end up in, being ready, prepare, preparedness for all eventualities. But very, very interesting interesting to hear the experience at the other really inspiring thank you thank you thank you um the next question goes to dr atif is from ibu amelia hapsari she says i really enjoy your presentation however at the end i was a bit confused are you saying by managing and processing data better we can overcome complexity of mega project, hence we can do mega project better? Or are you saying we could shift to mega projects to knowledge concierge? Very good question. So uh, the argument is the better management of data. So knowledge concierge is simply a tool um, that I'm developing uh, that enables that. Uh, and it's to the former point that we were discussing just now, which is if you are to get a handle of the complexity of your project, uh, uh, and what happened in past instances, you need to have that data structured in a meaningful way. Uh, and you'd be amazed for how few mega projects actually have that data. Even accessing a simple work program, you know, you know often done in a software called Primavera, getting at hold of that baseline uh, Primavera file for a mega project is a hard job. I mean, I have to pull teeth um, to, to get that. Um, you know, and once you do have it, you may have it at the integrated level, but then you may not have it at the contractor level, right? Um, so um, ma major point is be extremely uh, diligent in managing your mega project. Um, ap apologies, I'll take just one more minute to sort of expand on that point. One of the ideas in uh, recent strategic uh, management literature in ac academia is this notion of of diligence. And the idea is we used to think that high performance was by people who had something special, like some kind of a flair. And it turns out that that's not the case. It turns out that high performance companies or high performance projects or even high performance individuals are not somebody with some kind of a, 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 a spice, but people who do lots of the basic things right. And they do lots of the basic things to at least an average standard. So you don't have to be overly good at anything as long as you are okay in many things. To give you an example, in order to be a good golfer, you need to be able to putt 
and you need to be able to drive. If your drive is the world's best drive in the world, but you don't know how to putt, you will not be a very good golfer. So performance is a multiplication of, so another example, if you make uh, phones, your ability to make phones is your ability to make phone, the technology of the phone itself, and the ability to sell phones. So if you're really good at selling, but your product is bad, it's not gonna do very well. Equally, if you're really good at making, but you don't know how to market, it's not gonna go. So performance and multiplication of multiple attributes. And same with projects, you need lots of things to be performing just okay in order for the overall score to multiply to a big number. So you, you have to have enough safety, you can't have fatalities, uh, you can't have big injuries, but you also have need to have cost performance and cost control and time control and quality control. And only then, as long as all these dimensions are in place, do you get a good project. So just to re-summarize, re get a hold of your data. Knowledge Concierge is just a tool out, out in the market to help you get a, get a firm grip of your data. Thank you, Dr. Atu. Um, there's a question for Dr. Darmawan uh, from Adi Priyo. Hi, sir. Thank you for the bright presentation. His question is, can we identify the mega project failure from the beginning or earliest and how to measure it and mitigate it? Thank you. Uh, of course, the failures of mega project, especially in electricity, is uh, coming from different aspects. First is, of course, how are we going to come up with the right balance of contract? For instance, the demand is increasing, fluctuating. And then with renewable energy coming into the systems, even the supply also fluctuating. If we look at the contract, conventional contract between PLN and the third party is based on the coal fire power plants contract. Big chunk is going to stay stable in the next 25 years. It's not the case anymore. For instance, it's like we have 2,130 locations of diesel engine power plants. We're going to replace this with renewable energy. Huge project, two gigawatt. It requires a huge amount of battery, maybe 10 gigawatt hour of battery. If we still use the old contract, coal fire power plants, what is the demand? in the area actually is a remote areas. If we use the future demand and use the contract, PLN is going to pay a lot of the a lot of the corp, like what we are experiencing today. So how are we going to be able to come up with the auto corrective contract in which is going to be a win-win for both sides? So in this kind of a dynamic change with a lot of innovation of technology, we come up with somehow modular power plants instead of huge power plants. This is the biggest challenge. The technology itself is already very mature. For instance, a solar panel used to be like 10 cents, 5.6 cents. Right now it's only 3 cents. So it's quite mature and the sustainability of the, the supply of the energy is very good. Pricing is going down. But this dynamics is not in our equation before now has to be taken into account. And then also, we need to come up with the right technology. Because otherwise, when we're talking about coal, the price is just that that size, that amount. But when we're talking about renewable energy, the option is so many. And we need to come up with the right technology to ensure that the projects is going to deliver a well-balance between sustainability, 
reliability and affordability. And then of course there is a, some kind of project management that to ensure the progress is right there. If there is some kind of a technical challenge, we're going to be able to fix it in a very quick manner, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are shifting right now with the renewable energy coming into the systems, and the next project is going to be large renewable energy projects. We're talking about innovation. We're talking about national development capacity. We're talking about auto corrective contract, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Darmawan. The next question um, comes from and uh, is to Dr. Atif. It's from our friend in Oxford. Her question uh, is uh, Kimberly Herrocks, and her question is: Can you provide specific example of how AI is used to manage scheduling complexity or other complexity? Mm -hmm. Good question. So, you know, let's take an example of a, a baseline program of a rail mega project. Um, and that can contain at least 100,000 individual items that need to get done. Um, so, you know, that may exist in a form of some kind of a linear schedule, a software called TLOS is used for that. Uh, or equally, you may have um, all of those activities coded uh, in Oracle Primavera. Um, that's sort of the baseline program, you know, at, at the integrated master level, and you may have a lot more mess uh, in the bottom, so you may have 20 contractors operating on 20 sites. So there's some very simple, and I'll refer to this as machine intelligence rather than artificial intelligence, because, um, you know, some of it goes into the robotics category rather than AI, and we could debate what's AI and what's not AI, um, you know, se separately, but, uh, um, you know, simple ways in which how do you integrate all of those contractors programs into one master program? And how do you then make sure that they are rationalized so that one contractor is not stepping over another? So for example, if you have a limited site and you need night possession on that rail track and you need three contractors to work during a very limited time window, how do you schedule them? So that dynamic scheduling is something machines are taking over. If you leave it to human beings, it's just too much. They can't do it. It's, it takes too much time, and there's just too many calculations to make. Um, so they mess up, and then suddenly two contractors turn up at the same time, um, and nothing gets done. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, if you're trying to fix the, the, these antennas that you have to install in a rail line on signaling systems, um, the job itself is not very complicated. It probably takes a very specialized technician about half a day to do it. But you need possession of the track for that. And that window may only be available every six months. So although it's a half a day job, that possession may only be available every six months. If that technician is sick that day or had another job to go to and didn't turn up to this job because nobody reminded him or her to come there, you've missed that window. You've got to wait another six months now. Um, so that's where, you know, machine intelligence comes in play, making sure the technicians available, making sure the windows available, making sure they've got the reminders, making sure the human beings chasing them are also reminded. That's just an example of how it's done. Um, equally, uh, you know, if you're trying to analyze that risk, so that predictive bit, uh, bit that uh, Mawan also uh, mentioned, you know, where might the risk lie? So there's a very specific graph structure uh, from um, known as directed acyclical graphs. Um, to that schedule, um, and there's a huge mathematics that underpins these graphs, um, and you can run all manner of machine algorithms uh, to detect uh, issues in them. And uh, again, very happy to bore you uh, offline about what these algorithms look like. Thank you, Dr. Ati. Thank you. The next question goes to uh, Dr. Dharmawan. Uh, it's from Rebecca Purba. Uh, she asks, as many countries are developing green hydrogen, including PGE, is testing out one of its geothermal plants to develop green hydrogen. Could you share PLN's plan on developing green hydrogen, the cleanest energy so far in Indonesia? Thank you. Yes, we are exploring every single possibility of renewable energy, including green hydrogen. We have like geothermal, we have wind, we have solar, we have hydro, we have a large scale hydro, and we also have a green hydrogen. So 
Also, we have a technology using the current, underwater currents, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, right now, we're having a green RUPTL. And uh, of course, how much of each of the system is going to come into the power system that we have today, it depends on the sizing and also the levelized cost of electricity of each of those energy. For instance, today, energy coming from coal is roughly six cents per kilowatt hour. Energy coming from gas, if it's a pipe gas, is roughly eight, nine cents per kilowatt hour. If it's coming from LNG, it's roughly 10 cents per kilowatt hour. However, if there is a carbon tax, then it's going to shift. Energy coming from uh, coal fire power plants, is, we add roughly one until 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour then the competitiveness of this renewable energy is going to be much better because it's not going to be imposed upon the carbon tax. And right now, the technology still in the infancy is still uh, developing right now. Of course, with humankind of innovations, if the price can go down roughly as five cents, then it could become a very mass solution for this shortage of renewable energy in the future. But if the price is still roughly 10 or 12 cents or even 15 or 20 cents, then it's going to be very, very hard to enter the system without the subsidy coming from the government, meaning it's going to involve state budget coming from the, the minister, Ministry of Finance. So how much is the green hydrogen is going to come into our system? Of course, it depends on the innovations, the maturity of the technology itself. And what is the lifeless cost of electricity coming from that technology? Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dharmawan. A, uh, the next question is to Dr. Atif. Uh, it's from Geta. Uh, how do successful infrastructure projects harness innovation and technology during their life cycle, especially within a tight budget? Very good question. So, I mean, it's useful to have, um, again, depends on the project, right? So some mega projects are 10 to 12 years long, uh, and then you move away from risk into a world of uncertainty. So you also have to think about how might the project completely evolve uh, over time. One of the practices that uh, um, we've observed uh, in the data is, A, you need to set these things up upfront. So you need to have an innovation budget uh, up front um, is to think very carefully. So first of all, once you get started with a project, you've got fewer and fewer degrees of options. So you have to think very, very carefully right up front. And projects built with a design thinking view with very clear uh, kind of, if you will, um, platform rules uh, set up front tend to do better. So an example of that is Madrid Metro. Most metros are built in a very traditional way in which you sort of uh, have a whole design and every component is bespoke. M Madrid Metro at the very upfront decided to build a very modular system. Um, and the numbers are amazing. So Jubilee Line, for example, in London, which is built in a very traditional way, costs 300 million euros per kilometer. Madrid Metro costs 30 million euros per kilometer. And it's just as good, meets all the European environmental and safety regulations. So there's really no difference uh, between, I mean, it's not as pretty as the Jubilee line, but it's 10 times cheaper. You can't debate that, um, you know. So that, but so once you've started with the project, obviously your options to do anything in terms of innovation go down drastically. But having done that, you can still look at ways in which you can improve it. So Terminal 5 is a famous case in which as the project evolved, um, there was quite a bit of innovation in the way they did their, some of their design and, and the way they reconfigured it. Uh, but just keep in mind that that innovation is um, potentially very costly, number one. Uh, it still needs a process. Um, and you're better off doing that upfront rather than mid-flight. Thank you, Dr. Atif. The next question. Um... To, uh, to Dr. Dharmawan, uh, regarding the oversupply condition in the PLN group, what is the PLN strategy if in the future more and more customers install rooftop solar panel at their site? 
Well, we intertwine the rooftops with our systems, of course. But in the short run, of course, uh, in the RUPTL, we have a commitment reaching 23% of renewable energy by 2025. So that commitment is, uh, is, is being uh, uphold and we're going to deliver. And we are having a roadmap in the short run, 2022, 23, 24, and 25. And then uh, we understand that the rooftop is the way of the future. So that's why we are here digitizing our uh, power systems, not only our power plants, but also the transmission, distribution, and also the smart meter. With the rooftop is coming into our system, of course, there will be additional supply coming from the solar panel at 10 a.m. in the morning is going up. And then by 2 p.m. is going to go down is going to shut down totally by 5 or 6 p.m. in the afternoon at night. So that's why we are preparing our systems in such a way by digitizing our power plants, transmission and distribution, we are able to sustain that kind of shift fluctuations. I already uh, mentioned before that the fluctuation in the past is only from the demand side, but today the fluctuation is also coming from the supply side. So we are going to be able to deal with it. Of course, the reliability of the systems is going to be maintained if the size of the rooftop only certain percentage of the total system of the beban puncaknya dari Jawa misalnya. In that regard also, we already had a discussion with the Ministry of Energy, how we're going to regulate this rooftop in such a way, the additional of rooftop is going to also to maintain the reliability of the systems and also in somehow maintaining the balance between the supply and also the demand. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Darmawan. Um, there's a question to Dr. Atif from Jayani Safitri. What should be done so that mega project runs well at the time of Corona like this? Thank you. Very difficult. Um, I mean, these are, you know, the Corona is what's known as a black swan event. So very rare, very high impact uh, events. Um, you know, one of the heuristics for working with black swan events is you need to move with speed and scale. Um, so often it works better to do things incrementally, um, one step at a time. And I'm a big proponent of that, uh, partly because of my work on um, logical incrementalism and modularity, et cetera. But when you're faced with a huge amount of unforeseen risk, you have to move very fast and you have to move at scale, which means you have to tolerate making bad decisions. So you have to set fear aside that's the most important thing psychologically. You have to be unafraid um, and then really assess the situation. So that begins with what Mary Parker Follett calls an assessment of the total situation. So you really need to understand what's going on in your universe uh, and uh, form that holistic picture very quickly. So this is not a six month study. This is more like a um, you know, overnight briefing of, of all the key players. Uh, inside the organization. And then you have to formulate a uh, strategic response that's very fast and at scale. And you have to tolerate the possibility that what you choose may be wrong, but it's better to be wrong than not do anything at all. Thank you, Dr. Atif. And finally, oh, sorry, and reassess. You know, you just got to have that scanning and reassessing function in place. So you, you just be very, very responsive uh, in, a, in a high risk environment. A little bit like a, like a ship stuck in a storm. You know, you, you have to make decisions and you have to move quickly, but if the decision is not doing what you want to do, you have to reassess and, and do something different. Sorry, it's not a very helpful framework, but that's, uh, that, that's why these things are called black swans. <laughs> that's true. Thank you, Dr. Atif. Um, this moves on to the last question uh, to Dr. Dharmawan. It's from Jeffrey Muliono. If mega projects still depends on manual function world, 
how can it achieve success in post-COVID pandemic where we are currently depend on digital world? That's a very good question, <laughs> Dr. Ratif. <laughs> of course, uh, in the Dr. Ratif already presented, there is a causal effect in a very huge mega projects in our power systems. Let's say we cancel a substation project or we delay the substation project. Very soon, we're going to understand the cascading impact is all over the place. <laughs> Maybe a power plants that going to go online suddenly cannot evacuate its power to the customers. And we're going to have some kind of a take or pay. That's why right now, in the past, do you know that our contractors is more than 16,000 contractors? 20,000 contracts only in one year. Wow. Our spending is roughly, OPEX is roughly 300 trillion rupees. CAPEX is 70 trillion rupees. So it's roughly 27, 28 billion US dollars annually that we have to spend. So we need to streamline, for instance, from the national electricity planning to our long-term planning and then to annual planning and then to the operations before it was done manually. So for instance, it's like, okay, we're trying to reduce the capex from 70 trillion to 50 trillion. How are we going to do it without disturbing our systems development, our system sanctity? That's going to be very difficult because I was assigned exactly to do so. When I let the team and I say, oh gosh, I got a headache here. <laughs> so many things. And if I remove one thing, how is it going to affect the other thing? So that's why we need to come up with one thing. First is vertical integration is coming from digital systems. It's a handshake between the regional and the holding company. And then there is a horizontal integrations. How each project going to affect another? There is a causal effect. When we're talking about 10 projects, that's fine. When we're talking about 20 projects, we still can manage. When we're talking about 16,000, 20,000 projects and one another is interdependence, then it's becoming a big mess. <laughs> so that's why like, uh, that's a very good question. We need to manage. We need to come up with the systems. We need to come up with the artificial intelligence. We need to come up with the pattern recognition, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So we are digitizing our procurement. So we have a market intelligence. So it's becoming very transparent. It's very effective. It's very, very credible. We digitizing everything to ensure. And Dr. Latif is so that in that map, <laughs> so many dots and the human, the complexity human couldn't comprehend anymore. And that's exactly what it is. So we need to come up with a pattern. We need to come up with the digital platform. We need to come up with the artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera, to ensure it's going to be a timely delivery with a well-managed cost. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dharma Wan. Thank you, Dr. Atif. You. There are many, uh, there's a lot of questions, but I think we have to move on. <laughs> Thank you so much for the discussion. This is a very interesting topic and I hope we all gain positive insight from today's event. Before I close this session, please allow me to take some point as conclusion. Um, make a project is not only building infrastructure, but also to be diligent in managing all aspects such as environment friendly aspects, sustainability, efficiency, supply, demand, finance, forecast, risk management, um, and even about customer relationship and satisfaction management. And there are three aspects that cause a mega project to fail, which namely is optimism, optimism bias, strategic misinterpretation, complexity, and poor information management fuels the said aspect to jeopardize mega project that includes volume of false information and the velocity of information dissemination from source to people. The utilization of technology advancement will help makeups to perform better. Therefore, to utilize AI and robotics in data management and analytics, 
PLN agrees and approves that digital transformation is fundamental in managing mega projects. The nation's power and utility enterprise is now digitalizing both the strategic business process and the customer support. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our Rumi U Masterclass Series 2021. On behalf of Ruma Mentor Indonesia, Daya Dimensi Indonesia, Oxford Society of Indonesia, I would like to thank you all for joining us in this final masterclass. And may I ask you to fill in the online feedback form through the link on your screen. Your feedback is highly appreciated and very useful for us to cater your needs and improve our services. Before we conclude this masterclass, allow me to inform you that SAMI, Scholar Mentor Indonesia, was recently launched as a co-creating work between Rumi and Daya Dimensi Indonesia. We proudly present SAMI as a new initiative to support our country best talents to become world-class leaders. For those who are interested to take part in SAMI courses, please contact us on your details on your screen. Finally, we'd like to express our highest appreciation to our partners in Rumi U Masterclass Series the University of New South Wales and Plus Alliances Australia, the Australian Institute of Management in Western Australia, Erasmus University in Netherlands, Harvard Business Publishing, a subsidiary, a subsidiary of Harvard University, Singapore Management University, the University of Oxford of United Kingdom, and to all speakers and sponsors that have participated in Rumi U Masterclass Series 2021. We hope this would lead to more partnership and opportunity in our journeys to create world-class leaders of Indonesia. We look forward to more collaboration with you in the near future. Thank you, stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless you all. <laughs>